brings about their greatest music because I don't think any British band has ever come so close to tapping into the sort of soul of American roots music. But if you measure the talent, it's incomparable. What you're actually talking about is a wonderful rock and roll band. You know, they're out on their own. That transition from the 60s into the 70s was the Stones moment. So sort of the death of the dream was the Stones moment. Not we love you, not uh, all we need is love, not all of that kind of stuff. But when everybody started to get the whiff of the fact, you know what? The revolution's never gonna happen. In 1963, the Rolling Stones emerged from the British blues underground to storm the charts with a succession of inventive covers. The Ying to the Beatles' Yang. Through the canny publicity of manager Andrew Luke Oldham, they came to represent a more dangerous side of the booming teenage culture, offending parents whilst seducing their offspring. Originally formed by guitarist Brian Jones, the band's dynamics started to alter by the mid-60s, and after many singles in which they paid tribute to their blues and rock and roll heroes, the Stones began to work on original compositions. The key figures in transforming the band were lyricist and frontman Mick Jagger and the quiet rhythm guitarist Keith Richards, whose songwriting partnership elevated the band to the top ranks of popular music in 1965 with their hit, Satisfaction. The song just caught so much the tenor of the time. It was one of those songs that, you know, you know just became a kind of anthem immediately. Satisfaction is where the myth of Keith Richards as the human riff begins. Jagger then puts these fantastic words to it and, and the Stones never look back. I mean, this is the pivotal moment in their development. The band continued to ride on a high throughout 1966, their unmistakable raw sound bringing them to prominence in a market bursting with competition. I think that Jagger and Richards did bring something different into the whole British pop sound of the time and it was just really a kind of blacker edge they just found a kind of voice really that was very different from that of the Beatles and indeed from the Kinks or anyone else and it was it had a kind of swagger to it nowhere was that swagger more evident than on their hugely successful fourth album Aftermath which proved a major artistic breakthrough in consisting solely of Jagger and Richards originals in keeping with the times, the band promoted this record with a succession of singles and numerous tours. And at the end of 1966, they went to Olympic Studios to begin work on new material. In January 1967, the Stones unveiled the double A side in both the US and the UK, Ruby Tuesday and Let's Spend the Night Together. She would never say where she came from. Yesterday don't matter if it's gone. I think in a way Ruby Choosy could be looked upon as a sort of stones yesterday, if you like. Um, interestingly, um, there's a lot of evidence that Brian Jones had a very strong creative input into the writing of that song. Apparently him and Keith were sort of messing about on acoustic instruments in the studio and Brian started playing something that was a cross between some Elizabethan ballad and, and a, an old blues by somebody called Skip James. Brian Jones actually wrote Ruby Tuesday 
had the idea and then got it together with Keith and Keith added to it and then somehow Mick started to get in on the act and it became out, came out as a Jagger Richards composition but it was really a Brian Jones composition. I think they did tend, Keith and Mick, they did tend to plagiarise the ideas of others because apparently Bill Wyman came up with the central riff for Jumping Jack Flash, came up with it on piano and you know Mick and Keith turned up at the studio and said, you know, hey, that sounds good. And then they went away and worked on the riff and, and, and sort of built it into a song. And apparently Bill was so incensed about it that he actually got a deputation of him, Charlie and Brian together you know, intending to go and confront Nick and Keith with this sort of thing. Um, but, you know, apparently Charlie and Brian kind of lost heart. It's got a very English sound. I mean, for once, they're not looking to America, although when it comes to the vocal, Mick can't help doing his sort of American mannerisms. Um, I mean, that Englishness had been there before in songs like Lady Jane and, of course, As, As Tears Go By, but perhaps it reaches its, its high point in Ruby Tuesday. At the end of January, the album Between the Buttons was released, a record dominated by the same pop sensibility that had characterised Ruby Tuesday, it was to be the Stones' final collection, produced by manager Andrew Lug Oldham. The most overlooked period of the Stones, in a way, is what I call Phase 2. Phase 1 is the R&B covers band. Uh, phase 3 is the greatest rock and roll band in the world, the riffs, etc. Phase 2, which is a brief period, it doesn't last very long, is the Rolling Stones' pop band. And... They wrote some fantastic songs in this period and Between the Buttons as an album is probably the apotheosis of it. The social commentary of songs like Backstreet Girl, in a way these songs deserve to be up there with the work of Ray Davis who is always held up of course as, as the great writer of these 60s English vignettes and Jagger and Richard showed that, that they could do it. Uh, Ray Davis has carried on doing it. The Rolling Stones went on to do something else, which is perhaps why they've not received the credit for it. But uh, hugely underrated pop songwriters in that genre. Between the Buttons, it suffers from an appalling sound mix. I mean, there's, there's some good songs on there. I think uh, Miss Amanda Jones, um, and I'd much rather be with the boys that is from around that time and um, these are great songs but they have terrible sound quality you know they everything's buried and muddy and it was all done in a big rush because 65 66 the stones were just touring all the time they were they were doing like American tour after American tour and then they'd come and do a quick British one and it'd be like oh let's knock out an album you know we got three days or something like that and they'd be in and out and they'd leave the mixing to someone else. Something happened to me yesterday. The Closer, I, I regard as one of the great Rolling Stones songs, a complete goof, a wonderful lyric, uh, uh, really one of their absolutely classic performances and a very, very atypical one. Uh, I don't think they ever did anything else like it. And uh, it's such a goof. They didn't have what the Beatles had. They didn't have that kind of sophistication in terms of songwriting or production in the studio and that's not what they were about so there was some there was somewhere between the kind of um, punky bad boy stance of satisfaction if you like and the um, their own version of psychedelia on satanic majesties you know whereas the Beatles just forged ahead inventing a new language for pop the Stones couldn't really keep up with that because they couldn't write ballads like McCartney and they were never going to be capable of something as ambitious as A Day in the Life. And they returned to their essential kind of um, blues animus, if you like, that, that, that spirit, that essence, that they, they kind of got themselves properly on track with what the Rolling Stones were about. And be between the buttons, 
you know, uh, it is, is a transitional, uncertain record, I think, for that reason. This uncertain period in the Stones' career was shattered by events following the album's release. Keith Richards' Sussex home, Redlands, was raided by police. Jagger, Richards and art dealer Robert Fraser were all later charged and jail sentences handed out harshly. This was front page news in Britain, with many journalists damning the morality of pop stars and the emerging counterculture, while others saw these harsh sentences as persecution. The question over the effect that musicians had on the nation's youth rose to prominence once again. A national newspaper had tipped off the police to raid Keith Richards' house at West Wittering. In the house were found traces of cannabis resin and a pipe in which cannabis had been smoked. Evidence that an unnamed naked woman was sitting on a sofa with a rug around her was given in court today. As an idol of many young people in this country today, you have a very grave responsibility. It's a grave responsibility. How do you propose to exercise, exercise that now? Well, that's very difficult. And one uh, perhaps doesn't ask for responsibilities. Perhaps one is given responsibilities when one is uh, pushed into the limelight in, in, in this particular sphere rather than asking to be. And asked to be pushed into this and in a way merely asked to be my private life to be uh, left alone, so as it were. To, that my, res that my, my responsibilities, as far as that goes, are only to myself. You know. in, in the public sector, such as to do with my work, my records, and etc., I, uh, I have a responsibility, but in, in my private, uh, the, the amount of baths I take or my personal habits are of no. Uh, consequence to anyone else, I think. Do you mean this that you were picked upon because you are who you are? I don't think we were picked, on, picked upon in that way because but it's just that applies to everybody. I mean, yeah. The responsibility only applies to us because who we are. The news of the world had got Brian down at the speakeasy talking nonsense and offering pills and joints to everyone and they reported it as Jagger. Jagger immediately sued, spotted a wonderful opportunity, sued. And at that point, the news of the world, I think, felt that their best counter strategy was to, uh, was to set up a bust, which I think is what happened. There was a consciousness in the United States about what was going on with the Stones uh, in, in the kind of burgeoning counterculture, because there was a sense in which a lot of people were starting to take drugs. And, you know, that element of who was going to get targeted or, you know, what the risks were, you know, really came to the fore with the Rolling Stones. And, of course, then, you know, the Who and, to a degree, the Beatles, you know, speaking out in support just was one of those moments when you realized, well, this is the counterculture. This is something else. This is, you know, this is more than just a kind of, um, you know, a momentary blip in pop culture like this is going to be a cultural battle. And in many ways, uh, you know, those battles are still being fought. But, you know, the Stones were at the heart of it because they became the target. While the media frenzy continued, the group focused on the recording of their next album. Over the past two years, the psychedelia movement, spearheaded by writer and psychologist Timothy Leary, had begun to take hold of the youth culture in America, and its acid-soaked philosophy proceeded to change the sound of modern music. The work that the Stones created during these sessions very much reflected the times, and in August a new double A side was released that surprised both audiences and critics. We Love You and Dandelion. Psychedelia, I think, was a blind alley to the Stones because, you know, the whole psychedelic ethos was love and peace and community, and I don't think the Stones were ever about community. You know, I think they were about individualism at the extreme. It doesn't quite ring true, the sentiment, does it? The little film they made with um, Keith as the judge and Marianne Faithful as Bosie or whatever, I mean, I think that probably is a truer reflection of their, of their feelings. 
Um, I don't think they had a great deal of love for bent coppers. I think there was a great danger with We Love You. It's a common danger with topical singles, is what happens to them if they're no longer to topical. But I mean, I think if you boil it down, that um, We Love You is only topical because it had the sound of slamming jail doors in it, you know, relating to the, you know, the drugs case. <laughs> It certainly stands up more than the other side of it, Dandelion. I mean, in a way, that double A side w was a concept single as opposed to a concept album because a little vignette of We Love You is actually at the end of Dandelion. In December, after the sentences for Jagger and Richard's drug case were overturned, the Stones finally released their Satanic Majesty's request. Its tracks were characterised by the same psychedelic experimentation as We Love You, and it was certainly the Stones' most atypical album so far. Yet it divided critics, and many felt that the band were losing their unique voice. They were very spaced out when they made it, and the album was very spaced out as a result of it. They were trying desperately to do something which in some way would ke play catch-up to the Beatles' psychedelic Sergeant Peppers and they came up with their satanic majesties, but it was far too indulgent, not directed or controlled enough, and it just became a kind of um, piece of self-indulgent nonsense, really. Yet Brian Jones, in an increasingly troubled mental and physical state, once again introduced new musical elements to the band's tracks, and his experimentation was a key part of the album's sonic construction. That was the sort of album on which he could come into his own. He had this ability to pick up almost any instrument from a sitar to a, 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 a mandolin to whatever and uh, coax interesting sounds out of it. And an album like Satanic Majesties gave him the, the opportunity to do that. He could have brought like a, a food mixer into the studio and you know, they probably would have let him stick that on. You know, it was that kind of atmosphere. But it was ill-advised and, and also the the cover, you know, trying to outdo the Beatles, but oh, we'll have a three-dimensional cover, you know, that'll beat their Sergeant Pepper with all the faces on, you know, it really was a, a race. Was it like Sergeant Pepper? Well, that's an absurdity. The only way it was like Sergeant Pepper is that it had a really strange cover. A lot of the songs are very strong. They're very good songwriters, Jagger and Richards, you know, and they, they didn't write many bluff songs back then. They were hitting it almost every time. Uh, as some of them were... Uh, more trivial than others, and I would say that's true of several of the songs on that record, but as uh, melodic and rhythmic constructions, they're strong. They were really in a bit of a mess around the time of Satanic Majesties. Not least because Brian Jones was really going off the rails. And I think the Stones felt slightly um, out of place in that whole Carnaby Street caftan wearing era because they, they knew it wasn't really them. It didn't really answer particularly to what Keith Richards was about. You know, Keith Richards was not. George Harrison, he was really still wedded to a notion of music as black, rooted and intense and soulful. He was not interested in beads and bells. It's not serious, but on the other hand, it's not simply parody. Uh, it's not as if there's no sense that um, that they're not interested in these realms of experience, this kind of fantasy, this kind of sense of psychological possibility. Uh, they, they're dabbling in it in an interested way. Certainly not convinced, because they're never convinced of anything, but on the other hand, not just making fun of it. Uh, and 
And not only because had they done that, they would have really outraged uh, the fan base, but also because that was uh, their attitude, I think. I don't know. With them, you never really know, but that's, what I, that's the way I take it. And that's the way it comes off. I've campaigned over the years, actually, for its rehabilitation and written articles claiming it as a, as a lost classic, because I really do think it is. I think as a, a, an album of late 60s psychedelia, it's quite superb, and I don't... Well, I do understand why people don't like it. People don't like it because they're comparing it against Jumping Jack Flash and Exile on Main Street. Uh, you know, but if you, if you listen to it alongside other whimsical English psychedelic records of 1967-68, it's a great album. Although his unique contributions lifted the album, Brian was becoming increasingly isolated within the band. Having lost his girlfriend, Anita Pallenberg, to Richards, Jones's drug use was spiralling out of control, and despite his status as a founding member of the band, his future as a Rolling Stone seemed uncertain. Brian quite quickly began to feel odd man out, largely because of Keith and Mick's writing collaboration, and uh, there was a kind of undercurrent that this guy who considered himself to be the you know the leader had suddenly been eclipsed both by Mick as a front man and the Jagger Richards writing combination so he was um, a little isolated as a result of that he was both being eased out and easing himself out of the Rolling Stones commitment by his lack of responsibility to the band and his lack of effort he was rejecting them in the same way as they were rejecting him, in a way. You know, he would turn up for recording sessions and just lie on his back looking at the ceiling. Jones's despondency allowed Keith Richards to flourish. After the uncertainty of their previous albums, he turned his back on Carnaby Street and British psychedelia, and, as in the earliest days of the Stones, looked to America for inspiration. toured a lot in America throughout the sort of period of screaming hysterical girls and poppier songs like Get Off My Cloud or whatever, you know, and there was, a, there was a lot of time spent in America soaking up what this vast country meant, the mythology of this place, and they toured in the South and, and Keith was buying records which uh, by his own admission, he never really had time to listen to. Uh, and then come sort of 67, where, you know, the Stones were finally able to take a little bit of time off, get off the treadmill. And Richards has said that, he, you know, he, he actually unpacked a lot of these records he'd bought and started, you know, absorbing himself in American music again. You know, he, he started studying it again. And I think... That, coupled with the way the Stones had been scapegoated and vilified by the British establishment um, with the whole Redlands bust, it just, it kind of focused him again. And in 1968, you know, when flower power had faded away and, and the, you know, all that sort of Al Capone chic had passed through as well, there, were, there was a certain element of rock and roll revival you know, you've got sort of reissues of things like Rave On and Rock Around the Clock were actually getting into the lower reaches of the charts and, you know, something like Lady Madonna sounded very much like Fats Domino. And there were also a very strong element of plain and unadorned albums coming out, particularly by somebody like Bob Dylan, John Wesley Harding. It was just Dylan's voice with just sort of, you know, guitar, bass, drums in the background. Very simple, very sort of stripped down. And the Stones lent an ear to this. I mean, another strong influence, and this is kind of connected to, um, to Dylan, was music from Big Pink by the band. I don't have to She told it up 
And what they did, the Stones came up with something that kind of went back to the sort of bedrock, I suppose, of, of 1964, but was allied to modern technology. In February 1968, the Stones announced that they were going to be working with American producer Jimmy Miller in an attempt to realise the new sound that they were looking for. Miller had successfully broadened the sound of the band Traffic, and with the Stones' next release, he and Richard steered the group away from the more elaborate tendencies of psychedelic music. I went to a small recording studio in Morden, M-O-R-D-E-N, Morden, and uh, there was my mate Stu and Mick and Keith in the studio, and they played me, I think I was probably the first music journalist to hear Jumping Jack Flash. And I listened to it, and I went, this is amazing. Like, this is a totally different sound from what you've actually been doing before. Where have you got it from? And Keith gave me some convoluted explanation of how he'd recorded his guitar through a Philips cassette player, stood the microphone in front of the amp. I didn't really understand it. I'm not technically that good, you know. But I knew that he was telling me, you know, that this was how they got the sound, and I knew the sound was, was something special. It was thick, and it was all enveloping, and it was exciting, and it was rock. Pop was still singles, and it was moving really fast. And you have a period of, I don't know, maybe a year, maybe longer, where the Stones have no single. Uh, we Love You was a moderate hit. Uh, Satanic Majesties paled by comparison with the Beatles stuff. Um, the Stones seemed to have vanished, more or less. I mean, if you were a 14, 15-year-old music fan in England, the Stones seem to have faded. So the impact that Jumping Jack Flash made at the time is hard to understand now. I mean, you have to be there at the time to, uh, you know, suddenly the silence was broken and with a bang, you know, with a great record. Jumping Jack Flash was the turning point. And I think that was the point at which Keith really took over, started to take over the sound of the band because he'd now got his confidence right and he realized that he'd done something a bit special just the fact that he decided to kind of you know experiment with recording the guitar in that quite sort of punky lo-fi way is sort of such a it's such a rejection of of the over orchestrated aspects of of satanic majesties and it's just almost like saying we're a punk rock band <laughs> People like Jimmy Miller coming in onto the scene from America were very important too at this time. They did give them a kind of transatlantic sound, if you want to call it that, a kind of uh, ubiquitous Americana with the Brit, rock, pop, whatever you want to call it thing as well, which was an amalgamation of, of, their, um, of their sound. Jimmy Miller was, was a very clever drummer. He actually played drums on one of the tracks, I think, I mean, I'm not sure. He certainly had a stab at Jumping Jack Flash at one time. And there was one track he did that Charlie couldn't do, and I think he's actually, he actually does play it on the album. Charlie was very good about that, actually. He said afterwards, I remember doing an interview with him, and he said, Jimmy Miller taught me something about drumming at that point, and I always remembered it. He wasn't a great live drummer, but he was a good drummer in the studio. And, um, and Charlie was, as usual, very gracious about that sort of thing, which you know, somebody else might have been quite 
pissed off about, I would suspect. But Jimmy Miller was, was an important factor in, in Beggar's Banquet's success, I think. Jimmy Miller was incredibly important to the Rolling Stones. I mean, Keith aptly described him, an incredible rhythm man, you know? And when you listen to, you know, those records he produced with, with, with the Stones, everything is a rhythm instrument. You know, Jagger's vocal, the guitars, everything's moving, the cowbells, all of this stuff is, is, is rolling through. He'd get into the studio and play them himself, you know, something that, you know, something that the Stones would absolutely respect. And when Jumping Jack Flash came out, it was like, you know, somebody just kind of went and just kind of blew the fog away. I remember a friend of mine, you know, when we were kids, it just kind of come up to me and just said, God, have you heard the new Stone single? It sounds like Chuck Berry. You know, like, it, that was a good thing. <laughs> you know, that was a sense of, you know, the Stones kind of getting back to what they did best. In June, the Stones and Jimmy Miller returned to the studio to begin work on an album that would push them even further in this new direction. This process was in turn captured by the French filmmaker Jean-Luc Godard, who, at the height of his powers in the 1960s, shot a typically idiosyncratic documentary around the recording of one of the album's standout tracks, Sympathy for the Devil. I went to Olympic Studios in Barnes. I would sometimes, because I was quite close to them in the early days, because I knew Stu, I could sort of drop in at the studios and they wouldn't mind as long as I didn't make a nuisance of myself. So I did, you know, coming back from the Scotch of St. James on the Adelib. And I remember going to the studio one night and just walking in and Jean-Luc Goddard was doing Sympathy with the Devil. I was filming it. And I thought, what the hell? This is amazing. What is this? You know, this is another total departure from anything the Stones had done before. And Marianne was there. And uh, she said that it stemmed from a book that she'd given Mick called the Master Margarita. She'd given the book to Mick. Mick had got the inspiration for, for Sympathy with the Devil from that book. And I was listening to it in kind of fragments in the studio. I didn't really get the full impact of it, but I did know that there was something really different going down. Well, Keith, I thought having the solo on the third, on the fourth one, instead of the... Because that's the way, it's the way it sort of is, you know, the, mm. the last verse is different. So we'll have it like three verses straight through and then the solo, whatever it is. Should start off very cool. Should be very cool. Goddard, despite being at the very high end of cinema, was a complete cinema guy, and that means he was a complete, he was completely interested in the developments of popular culture. In Masculin Feminin, for example, a film he shot in 65, he'd taken a French, a young French pop star and used her as the uh, main uh, uh, character. Difficult to say exactly what God I was aiming at, but on the, one plus one in general is an attempt on the one hand to take the creation of a track of the Rolling Stones at that time and juxtapose it with a whole lot of ideas about black power, revolution, feminism, etc. It seems to me that the attempt to conjugate all those other things together really doesn't work. There's moments of humour and there's moments of insight. On the other hand, as an actual documentary of the Stones actually recording a song, you have all Goddard's kind of brilliance at actually recording the moment. Um, I don't think he thought of it in any, in any way as a simple documentary, but in many ways the force of the film is actually to really show you the Stones recording a song. As well as documenting the recording process, Godard was also able to capture the changing dynamics between the various members of the band. When you see the Godard film, Sympathy for the Devil, you see this sad figure of Brian Jones in another world and Keith is picking up the bass and he and Jagger are really driving it by this stage. There's another bit in the film where uh, Jagger turns to Charlie Watts and says, oh, you know, for heaven's sake, Charlie, put some life into it. And the two of them, Mick and Keith at this point, are, are absolutely driven. Goddard's film was released in November 1968, a week before the release of the album Beggar's Banquet. Although many fans were bewildered by Godard's work, 
The track Sympathy for the Devil opened the new record and would become another classic in the Stones' canon. Sympathy for the Devil is melodically not that interesting, but rhythmically it's a fabulous track. Uh, and we have the Goddard stuff, the one plus one um, thing, where they clearly they have no idea how to take it at all. You know, they are trying it as a ballad, they try it as a samba, they try it, and eventually they hit on this thing. And Anita comes up with the woo woo, is the witches chorus, and uh, you know, the whole thing falls into place. If you take a title like Sympathy for the Devil, you know, that's a very different kind of idea than this kind of angelic 60s vision that we've been given, and almost in a kind of Blakeian way. You know, the Stones and, and a lot of other people, I mean, obviously, you know, Jimmy Page are, you know, in a, in a, in a different and, and harsher way, obviously, Charles Manson. I mean, the, you know, this kind of stuff was in the air as, as the 60s began to fade. And... Yeah, there was a kind of fascination with, um, you know, what's on the other side of this coin? You know, what, you know, well, if, you know, if we're not getting back to Eden, you know, what are the other possibilities? Sympathy for the Devil is an incredibly important, even anthemic song. And what it tells us is that um, we are no longer in this sort of dizzy utopia of LSD and flowers and love and peace. And Satan is sexy, suddenly, you know. And the Stones, more than anyone else in that period, flirted with the diabolical. And it had a lot to do with an idea of decadence that was endemic to uh, the smart set in London, if you like, that the Stones were welcomed into. And it tapped into Alastair Crowley. It tapped into a tradition of devilry, if you like, that's always been there on the kind of fringes of English culture. This is a big part of what the Stones are doing here, you know, and it taps into blues mythology. Robert Johnson, Hellhound on my trail. And the deep keeps on worrying me The hellhound on my trail Hellhound on my trail Hellhound on my trail This is, this is a big part of what the Stones are steeped in. Baker's Banquet was released in December 1968 and was instantly hailed as a masterpiece. Both a return to basics and a significant progression, this collection of powerful songs reclaimed the Stones' position as one of the greatest acts in popular music. There was a real reaction to just the volume and overkill, really, of 1967, where there was, you know, Hendrix, really, I suppose, and Cream. You know, Beggar's Banquet was... You know, it was full of country blues and playful appellations, sort of country arrangements, string band arrangements. You know, Factory Girl, Dear Doctor, Prodigal Son. It sounds really authentic to me. I mean, it sounds like a bunch of, you know, decadent English white boys. How almost folky some of it sounds. There's a lot of acoustic guitars on there. I mean, some great riffs on there. Uh, but it's not nearly as heavy as some of the, the later albums. And it's got a very appealing, um, slightly ramshackle, semi-acoustic feel to it. They're really kind of digging deep into the sort of roots of, of, of American music and they're throwing off the sort of spangled cloak of flower power and we're just not interested in that anymore we're not interested in debutantes we're really now interested in in this idea of america it brings about their greatest music because i don't think any 
British band has ever come so close to tapping into the sort of soul of, of, of American roots music. Jagger's approach to lyrics was also evolving, and with this new set of tracks, he seemed to be finding his own distinctive voice. There was a, a sort of element of Jagger just kind of, as a writer, I think, really engaging the times. You know, Street Fighting Man, I mean, the kind of ironic anthem, an ironic political anthem, you know, this kind of sense of frustration at the same time as, you know, we're a band, you know, we're not, you know, we're not leading the revolution. Street Fighting Man was very reflective of the period in time with people on the streets for one reason or another, whether it was CND or anti-Vietnam or whatever it was. It was very reflective of student unrest and young people's disenchantment with the government and the authority of the times. But I don't think he was leading that. He was simply looking at the papers and the news and seeing what was going on and then reflecting it as a younger person. Most great rock songs reflect the attitude of the audience and the generation at the time and the way that they feel. They hold a mirror up to the audience and they reflect back at each other. That's what rock music actually does. Even as the Stones were, in a sense, coming apart, I mean, because this, you know, in a sense, that record is about the, the dissolution of Brian Jones, it also announced a kind of resurgence of the Rolling Stones chronicling a very complicated and troubled time and not, you know, this wasn't flower power. You know, this is definitely sort of post flower power. This is a kind of understanding of what was ahead. In keeping with this darker vision of the 1960s, Jagger had spent the months following the recording of Beggar's Banquet on his first major acting role. The project, which the singer had been involved in since its early development stages, was the brainchild of writer and artist Donald Camel, a disturbing and dreamlike evocation of late 1960s Britain called Performance. Camel had known Jagger for a very, very long time. Jagger had become part of the Chelsea set, of which Camel was a member, um, very early on, certainly by 1965. And they had talked about doing a film together for a very long time, so Jagger was in place. Um, uh, funnily enough, Jagger was in place from the moment Brando dropped out because the, the, the very, very, very original idea was that Brando was going to play the gangster. After Brando dro dropped out, Jagger was there for uh, at least two or three years while the script developed uh, from something quite different or relatively different to the script we know today. Jagger's own performance as the faded rock star Turner colliding with an East End gangster was notable in its similarities to Brian Jones and Camel had indeed based elements of the film on the lifestyle of the Rolling Stones' founding member. There's no question that the house in Power Square is based in many ways on the Jones house in Courtney Road and uh, the Jones and Pallenberg house. It's decorated in the same manner and Jagger uses many of Jones's uh, mannerisms. Why? Because you're afraid of him. Yes, right. Right. <laughs> and he's afraid too. Of you? At the same time, it's not simply a documentary account uh, of Jones. Uh, it's a great deal to do with Camel. I mean, in some sense, it's autobiographically, it's, it's, it's most strongly about uh, Camel himself. Sorry to disturb. Has anyone got a sixpence for the phone? Uh, can I uh, use the blower up here? We haven't got a blower up here. <laughs> what in God's name has he done to his hair? He's blown it. 
It's the dark side of the sort of swinging London 60s, isn't it, really? With Donald Camel obviously being related to Alistair Crowley and the fact that Anita's in there as well. You know, it's it's like you, 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 you can't make this stuff up. It's just such a sort of perfect kind of dramatisation of of the, the forces that were sort of swirling around at that time. After endless battles with Warner Brothers and several recuts, the film was finally given a limited US release in 1970 and a much more successful release in Britain the following year. Critical reaction was, however, very divided. Whereas the film drew some criticism, its soundtrack was remarkable, including a standout track by the score composer Jack Nietzsche and Mick Jagger, Memo from Turner. Memo from Turner is, is a fantastic track, and what's going on there really is that Jack Nietzsche, who put the performance soundtrack together, um, was himself uh, very smitten with the Stones. You know, and Nietzsche was a pretty creepy character in his own way and it's you know he had his own sort of slightly satanic dabblings and so the stones answered to that slightly sinister side and in a sense Mario from Turner is Nietzsche kind of putting together his own idea of the stones around um around Jagger with with Rai Kuda playing the the, the the bottleneck guitar when the black man there drew his knife. Oh, you drowned that Jew in Rampton as he washed his sleeveless shirt. You know, that Spanish-speaking gentleman, the one that we all call Kurt. It was Mike Cheryl. Performance contains the one great solo moment by any of the Stones, really. Uh, you know, it's the greatest Rolling Stones track, not by the Rolling Stones. And... Uh, Ry Cooder's guitar is absolutely incredible, uh, as Keith Richards realised, because um, he went on to allegedly steal one or two of Ry's licks. Everywhere you look at it, it's from the last poets to Robert Johnson. This is a film which is absolutely on the music money. Um, how they did it, I've no idea, but they did it. Your organ's working perfectly, but there's a part that's not screwed on. There were many attempts, many, many attempts to put um, uh, rock music and uh, film together from the Presley movies on. Um, and um, there were some successes. I mean, the Beatles films are, are, are quite considerable films. But there's no doubt the performance is just head and shoulders above them all. Um, and most of them have been dreadfully unsuccessful. So as a way of capturing uh, rock music and its energy and its problems on film, uh, performance I is without equal. The whole band decided to follow Jagger's example and to try to make the transition to the big screen. They put together a concert film that would include performances from The Who, Marianne Faithful and John Lennon, but on seeing the finished product it was the Stones themselves who deemed it so disappointing that it wasn't officially released until 1996. That was again an attempt, a mistaken attempt by Mick to follow in the footsteps of the Beatles who did the Magical Mystery Tour, so they thought they'd do a circus. I, that was my last job for the New Musical Express to cover the Rolling Stones Rock and Roll Circus. That you can't always get what you want, honey. You can't always get what you want. You can't always get what you want. That Rolling Stones rock and roll circus thing was another one of those kind of mistakes that they made. They couldn't get it quite right at that time for some reason. The idea, the line-up was fantastic. The Who stole the show. Ten times better than, than, than the, the Stones were. Probably another reason why Mick didn't put it out. 
Yet inside the Stones' camp, far greater problems were coming to a head. As the band worked in the studio on their follow-up to Beggar's Banquet, it became clear that the inspiration for Turner, Brian Jones, was spiralling out of control. Having lost his girlfriend to Richards, and having become a less prominent member of the band, the former teen pin-up and party animal had become a broken man. Amongst them all, Brian was a clubber. He used to like uh, the publicity, he used to like the people around him. See, Brian, uh, very funny, really. He had so many people around him. Some were good, some were bad, some were le leashes, you know. But he couldn't bear to be on his own. To me, although there were all these people around him, he was a very lonely man. That's my opinion of Brian. Because sometimes he used to talk to me uh, and I could feel he was hurting, you know. Brian, he could be lovable, very polite, very nice, but he could be also, he could be a bastard. There weren't too many people after the first two or three years that had a good word to say about Brian, which is very sad because he could be quite charming, he was very articulate, he was always absolutely charming to me as a, as a journalist, but then he was usually charming to people he thought could be useful to him. Um, he was intelligent, he was well read, but somewhere along the way there was a kind of, a, it, there was a weakness, a flaw, and once he used, started to use the drugs as a prop, then that really undermined him, that really underpinned him. By that time I knew anyway that you know, there was a lot of animosity going on. But unfortunately Brian, he got in such a state, he just couldn't get it together, he couldn't hack it. He just could not do it. He fell apart. He became a figure of, of almost of um, fun to the other guys in the band. Keith and Mick would ridicule him because of his behaviour. Yeah. Uh, and it was sad. Um, perhaps if they'd have been a little older and a little wiser like they are now, they might have been a little kinder and a little more supportive. But Brian did rather ask for it. Now ostracised from his own bandmates, his continued involvement in the Stones made him a liability. In June 1969, Mick, Keith and Charlie visited Brian at his farmhouse and the founding member of the group was fired. Ultimately, it was very important that Brian Jones fade out of the picture. You know, that was the making of the stones. It was the cementing of the Jagger-Richards partnership that, that, that Brian just dropped out. He was a mess, emotionally and chemically, a complete mess. A guy whose heart had been in the right place, he'd been a passionate student of the blues, but who wasn't capable of um, accepting the challenge of the Rolling Stones' status. After three days, statements were issued and Brian's departure was made official. Young guitarist Mick Taylor, who had replaced Peter Green in John Mayall's Blues Breakers two years before, was announced as Jones' replacement. Yet further drama was to unfold less than a month later, when Brian Jones was found dead in the swimming pool at his country home. About midnight, Jones went for a swim with his Swedish girlfriend, Anna Volin, and another friend, Mr Frank Thorogood. After a time, Mr Thorogood and the girl went back to the house. When they returned, they saw Jones at the bottom of the pool and they pulled him out. I was at Olympic Studios the night that death happened and uh, Tom Keylock, who was their minder, appeared about two o'clock in the morning and the word went round the uh, studio that something had happened down at the farm and that he died in the swimming pool. And uh, at first I wasn't being told about it, I was in the control room looking out into the studio and I could see these little groups quite seriously talking together and uh, Charlie came in at one point quite tearful and Marianne was there and she was very tearful and uh, 
Jagger was curious mixture of anger and sadness, I think. But the anger was dominating. And I remember him saying, it goes on, it goes on. And it, this was taken to mean by some people that, it, that uh, the session went on, which it did kind of dribble on for about an hour. But nothing really was probably, it was going through the motions to give them something to do because they felt, I think, pretty awful about the fact that Brian had died. I think what Jagger was saying was, the Rolling Stones goes on. Nobody was really that surprised, too. There are people, I mean, I'm sure that everybody's got those feelings about certain people. Everybody knows people that mm. you just have that feeling that they're not going to be, they're not going to be 70 years old ever, you know. They're, not everybody makes it, you know. The Stones already had a free concert in Hyde Park planned two days after Jones's death, and they decided that the show must go on. Jagger read a Shelley poem, and then released hundreds of white butterflies in remembrance of Brian. But it was also Mick Taylor's first live gig, and in many ways it marked the passing of one era and the beginning of another. I think the, the death of Brian Jones really washed over the Rolling Stones, had very little, I mean, they're, they're hard men, you know. I mean, let's not forget Jagger and Richards didn't turn up to the funeral. Um, Mick led off the butterflies in Hyde Park at the free concert, uh, and read Shelley for him, but he didn't go to the funeral. He was already off to Australia to, to make Ned Kelly, you know, and he wasn't going to delay the shooting of his first major feature film to go to his old friend's funeral. So there was a very hard attitude there. Um, and I think they felt, in a way, Brian had effectively been dead to them for, for, for quite a long time. But, you know, let's not overlook the fact that Brian did make some fantastic contributions, which Mick and Keith have spent the last 40 years talking down, but it is undoubtedly there. It's undoubtedly there in their first phase as an R&B band. It's very much there in their phase as a pop band, where he's introducing the Mellotron and the sitar and all of these other instruments that give it additional fresh textures. So his contribution in certain key periods was critical. Um, but by the time he died, they had already moved far, far beyond Brian Jones. This movement led the Stones further down the path of American roots music and to country. This genre, previously so emblematic of conservative values and the American right, was by 1968 being popularized by the Birds and the International Submarine Band. Rock was moving in on Nashville territory, with first Bob Dylan and then Neil Young recording in country music's capital city. In 1969, a slew of country rock albums were released, including Dylan's Nashville Skyline, which featured a duet with Johnny Cash, and the Flying Burrito Brothers' seminal debut album, The Gilded Palace of Sin. Once again, honing in on trends from across the Atlantic, the Stones released their unique take on country in July 69, Honky Tonk Women. There was a movement back to roots music of all sorts in the late 60s. There was a kind of sense of exhaustion with, you know, psychedelics and, you know, going, you know, into other realms. There was a sense of, you know, let's put our feet on the ground. And there was, you know, a, a renewed fascination with the blues and country music, of course. Something like Honky Tonk Women played right into that. What people, I think, heard was just all that rhythm. When it came on the radio in the U.S., I mean, people went nuts. <laughs> Keith had always loved country music. Um, I mean, Jagger recalls Keith as a little boy, you know, dressed up as a cowboy and, <laughs> and guns. Um, but, uh, you know, Keith always had a passion for, for, for country. Um, Jagger always regarded it as, as a bit of a joke, which is why a lot of the Stones' country tracks don't work, because Keith is treating them seriously, musically, and then Jagger comes up with this sort of pastiche vocal. This used to work Keith a bit. I mean, they'd be all drunk in the studio doing Far Away Eyes, and, and it really does sound like Mick sending up 
the CB radio and uh, country music radio station culture. Um, yeah, I'm, I mean, if, he, if he'd have done a blues and affected a fake black voice, which, uh, you know, he would have got totally bold, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's a difficult one because you don't know where the tribute ends and the piss taking starts. <laughs> I don't think that country people like this stuff very much at all at the beginning and I then I but then you know you know then what happens in country music is that you know basically Nashville is the conservative wing of American popular music so now what you have in you know where's the great what's the great repository of AOR musicians Nashville there's you know all these people uh, uh, walk into the studio who plays the same kind of stuff that the Rolling Stones would have played 30 or 40 years ago and do it real well they've listened to the Rolling Stones they're all Rolling Stones fans uh, and, uh, and they're all Keith Richards fans, I'm sure. Honky Tonk is a country style, that's right. But a Honky Tonk is also a black blues joint. Before it was a country style, it was an it was a, a African-American term. And so it never was fully country in terms of how it was identified. Not fully. Yet on the subsequent album, the Stones re-recorded the track in an attempt to fully integrate a country style. Without Brian Jones to introduce new instruments and sensibilities, they enlisted studio musicians to broaden their sound, and on Country Honk they enlisted fiddle player Byron Berline, who had previously worked with Gene Clark and Graham Parsons. They put up the track, and uh, I played a couple of passes through it. They said, come on in. I thought, oh, they don't like it. They're going to just can it. They're just going to say, see ya, get lost. <laughs> And Glenn Johns and uh, whoever, I don't remember exactly who said it, Mick maybe or whoever, and said, we have a, an idea. We want you to go out on the sidewalk and record this outside. We have a better ambience, we think. Okay, nothing surprised me. I knew everybody was experimenting with all kinds of different things back in those days. So we put everything out there. They put a little speaker out there so I could hear the track. Didn't have earphones, they just put a speaker and a microphone and uh, started running it down. And they're all standing around, and uh, uh, cars going by, of course, everybody was... Oh, I, before, I, before when we walked outside, they were building, they were working on the studio, and they had a cat, a big bulldozer out there uh, pushing dirt or something. And <laughs> I forget it, Mick Jagger goes out and goes... And the guy just, I mean, immediately just shut it off and just got off. It was like... What? You know, he just stopped it right then and just left. <laughs> I guess he knew who he was. Like I think any recording artist, uh, rather than doing their their stuff, uh, their musicians playing the same thing all the time, they welcome a new sound maybe to to complement their music. I think that any artist is like that. After they record so many albums and so many songs, gee, many Christmas. I mean, you know, <laughs> you get to the point where, man, it'd be nice to add a little something here, not to get too far away from their sound, but to. Uh, Complimented, maybe. This introduction of a multitude of session players marked out the Stones' follow-up to Beggar's Banquet, Let It Bleed. As well as featuring Mick Taylor's first contributions to the Stones' music, it had an impressive cast of extras, including Ry Cooder, Mary Clayton, Leon Russell, Al Cooper, and performance composer Jack Nietzsche. This fuller sound was successfully integrated into the band's music by producer Jimmy Miller, and Let It Bleed was to become another classic in the Stones canon. It would be one of the, the 20 albums I'd take with me to the desert island. I mean, Let It Bleed is worth it for Gimme Shelter alone, isn't it? I mean, Gimme Shelter is one of the, the finest things ever created on vinyl. The, uh, the intro, the build of the intro, uh, it's one of my favorite guitar solos. It's such a concise guitar solo. 
there are certainly some very strong tracks on it. I mean, you know, with Gimme Shelter, the obvious example, I mean, with that sort of wraith-like flutters of harmonica, and I think it stands up well as a song, you know, the fact that it's borne out by the fact that later on they, somebody actually recorded an album consisting entirely of different versions of Gimme Shelter. <laughs> By any reckoning, I think Gimme Shelter has to be, you know, deemed one of the five greatest Stones tracks. That transition from the 60s into the 70s was the Stones moment. So the death of the dream was the Stones moment. Not we love you, not uh, all we need is love, not all of that kind of stuff. But when everybody started to get the whiff of the fact, you know what? The revolution's never going to happen. You know, we're not going to get back to the garden. You know, it's give me shelter. You know, that's what's going to happen. The feel, the mood of the of the piece is so kind of eerie and, and, and sort of apocalyptic. And you really feel like, you know, the 60s are, are coming to their sort of bloody finale somehow in, in, in this track. And uh, I also think it was a stroke of genius um, that Jimmy Miller brought in Mary Clayton to wail away because it just takes it into a different dimension. There's a sort of desperation to this track, a real sense of foreboding and an unease, which um, is, is extraordinary. It's so haunting. All they basically wanted was me on the record, you know. They knew what I would, I think they kind of knew what I would bring to it. I would bring Mary Clayton to it, you know, just bring myself to it. It wasn't anything made up where you sang this part and I'll sing that part and he'll sing that. It wasn't any, any of that. I just bought my heart and soul to it. Half sleep, pregnant, and <laughs> rollers in my hair and all. I remember three takes of it, of my part of it. I started to, uh, oh, chill, shall I, shall we? And we, right, man, oh. by that time, some kind of way, it was so late, my throat cracked. It was a crack in that particular song. They said, no, don't do it again. We love the crack. We love the crack. Leave it in, leave it in. Can you do it again? I said, sure, I can do it again. <laughs> Shelter is a complete masterpiece. Because I hate 60s nostalgia, the whole notion of how horrible things were back then is sort of annoying to me. But insofar as there was a sense of a crackdown and there were bad things going on, that song captures it as well as anything I can think of. The civil rights movement was going on still going on. Black people were fighting for rights. Dr. King, I think Dr. King had just been assassinated. Black people as a whole at that particular time were, we were just distraught, you know, because our leader was dead, you know, and I took all of that stuff, all that stuff must have been built up inside of me. So when I took on a song like that to sing, give me shelter, please give me shelter from the racism, from the war, from all the craziness to go on the police, from everything that's going on in the world today. Can you please give us all, sh we really need shelter. And I was really like pleading to God, you know, please Lord, give us shelter. <laughs> was stuff brewing that the song wasn't about because people didn't really know it was brewing. Nixon was president by then. Uh, what was really going on in the historical, long-term historical context was that conservative ideology was reasserting itself and was going to take over for capital. Um, and, uh, and we all need shelter from that. The reason the song uh, I, maybe the reason the song seems so profound now is that even if it wasn't as true as it might have been in 1969, it's continued to have relevance. 
Uh, and we now, right now, live in a world in which uh, needing shelter is uh, an all too vivid part of our lives, not to mention the lives of the people we're destroying. I think th that track and the album showed that Jumping Jack, Flash and Beggar's Banquet weren't a one-off. It showed that the Stones had staying power and uh, they could sustain it. And, and in fact, they were getting better and better. In November 1969, the Stones embarked on their first North American tour since July 1966. And these concerts were an entirely new live experience for both the band and the audience. Previously, the Stones had played in small venues to screaming teenage girls. But they were now a rock band and their audience had matured. Beginning at Colorado State University, the Stones packed out large arenas, including two nights at New York City's Madison Square Gardens. I remember going to see the Rolling Stones in 1969 in New York, and uh, it was ecstatic. I mean, there was a moment, I mean, the opening acts, as I recall, were B.B. King, Ike and Tina Turner, and Terry Reid. And, you know, that was all great. And then suddenly, like, the lights were out in this theater, and then just... You know, there was no big screens, no big stage show. I mean, there was none of this kind of production stuff. It was in an arena. Uh, but, you know, all the lights were out in the place, and all you could see were the red lights on those amps. And I remember sitting there thinking, like, the Rolling Stones are going to be on that stage. Like, I could not believe it. It was so exciting. And they were great. I mean, they became a great band at that point, I mean, with Mick Taylor. They closed every night with Street Fighting Man, and there was just this kind of sense of, you know, people were on their seats and pumping fists, and as ironic as that song is, man, everybody was feeling it. Like, you know, it was one of those moments when, you know, things were really shaken here, and it really seemed like things were going to tip. Like, you know, the, that desire to just, like, <laughs> smash something, just kind of run out and, you know, like, Let's just take shit over. It was it was on, and it was on in a big way. And the Stones were uh, were right at the heart of it. Yet, right at the heart of it would become an uncomfortable place for the Stones to be situated. After closing their tour, they were to play one last show at the free concert being held at the disused Altamont Speedway in Northern California. On a bill that included the Grateful Dead, Santana, the Flying Burrito Brothers, and Jefferson Airplane. The Stones were hoping for an explosive end to their tour, the concert film being shot by the Maisels brothers of this tour, and to the decade itself. The Stones' decision to use the Hells Angels as security for the concert was disastrous, however. And by the time that Jefferson Airplane hit the stage, the situation was turning ugly. There was very little doubt that flower power had wilted by 69. <laughs> Um, the, leave, the wear some flowers in your hair when you go to San Francisco and Donovan had, had be, already begun to fade. The Maharishi was becoming a bit of a memory. And I think they'd realized that things like free love weren't free and it wasn't love. And that flower power might have been a good idea and peace and love might have been a better one but you had to have some kind of infrastructure to put it in place. And it went badly wrong at Altamont when the Grateful Dead recommended to Jagger that he hire the Hells Angels. I think he made the mistake of thinking he'd still got the Hells Angels that were in England when they did Hyde Park. It was a remarkably stupid decision to have used them, I think. The Hells Angels were killers in America. They were killers. The LA chapter of the Hells Angels were renowned for murders. It was not the bunch that, of happy bikers who turned up for the Hyde Park concert. 
When the stones eventually appeared, the crowd was weary, frightened and high. The angels, on the other hand, were drunk and violent. No one was aware that they were involved in such an important historical event, that this concert would be seen as one of the key moments in the fall of the counterculture. The counterculture was already out of control by the time Altamont took place, you know. I mean, the fact is it, it had failed, the experiment had failed, you know, as it was doomed to do. I mean, there is no more pathetic sight, really, than Mick Jagger at Altamont in the film, Give Me Shelter. Completely lost, you know, just a sort of skinny little English boy with a silly cape on, trying to get on top of this horrendous scene, you know. The Hells Angels aren't called Hells Angels for nothing, you know. They're nasty, brutish, pre-rock, leather, greasy Neanderthals. They're vile. And, uh, and, and, they, and they always have been. They were never interested in peace and love. And, and so to Im somehow try and embrace the Hells Angels as some sort of alternative security force within this kind of um, coda to sort of Woodstock, if you like. It was just asking for trouble. The night ended in chaos and the famous murder of 18-year-old African-American Meredith Hunter. It was, in many ways, the end of an era, and the stones retreated from these uncertain times and looked for shelter. Look fundamentally changed. They would never return to the ironic anger of street fighting man and distance themselves from any politics or idealism. Although their music would continue to appeal to a growing fan base, the death of the dream that had been documented with Gimme Shelter led to an increased cynicism and personal isolation. The stones was like this sort of travelling rock and roll circus, really, that, you know, decamped to the south of France. You know, it just, it, it, it became more sort of cocooned. And Keith, you know, obviously began to kind of hit hard drugs a lot harder. And, the, you know, the more heroin you do, the less outward you look, the more, you know, the more internalised your emotional experience becomes. Disillusionment with the counterculture has set in. The, the, there's a sort of acceptance that actually sex and drugs and rock and roll are not going to change the world, so we might as well just boogie. Um, at the same time, it, it, this has made things a lot darker in some ways. So uh, the Stones are, are freer to explore those sort of nasty areas and yeah I guess all of that is a reflection of um, the fact that the spirit of 67 had all gone sour in 69 with Charles Manson, Altamont and all the rest of it. Yet this period of the Stones career is unique when they lost both their direction and a founding member only to re-emerge as the greatest rock band in a very uncertain world.